Well, hello, buddy, and welcome back to a new episode of the Showrunner Whisperer. This is your podcast where we take you inside the minds of Hollywood television showrunners and what goes into making a TV show in today's Hollywood landscape. I'm your host, Andy B. As always, first of all, if you're a new listener, welcome. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. So happy to see all of you. We're to end, we're getting towards the end of July, and first of all, just to you know, clear that clear. The air a little bit. Uh, I know part two of um, my chat with Mark Guggenheim was supposed to go out uh, the the previous week, um, but uh, there was some. There was th- this has been a very busy month for good old Andy uh, with a lot of things uh, with uh, writing and also just things in my personal life. So I pre- so I apologize that I I forgot I had even not even put out a update on on socials. So. I'll get better at it. I promise. I promise. Um, but um, I want to thank everyone who had such a you know huge response to part one of my chat with Mark. And I saw a lot of, uh, I, there were a lot of things from that interview that I was not expecting to go viral. Uh, so it was cool seeing you know like the show whisper in the deadline and TV line and Time Weekly. You know, big shout out to my good buddy. Uh, at Screen Rants and Cinema Blend and KTV TV and so on. Always love, uh, always love the love and support. So and and so much, you know, so many of you online have responded really well to the interview. Like of her right now on on YouTube, part one is the most viewed episode of the Show and Whispers so far, which makes me super happy. And and I appreciate all of you again. It's this has been a product I've been working on for so long that I you know again I didn't know how. Fat people were going to respond to it. How like would was would, would there be an audience for it? Would I have would I have the same luck that I had when I did something like the Flash podcast for ten years, basically? So, but I again once again thank you so much. And as um, as a reminder right now, uh, because we you know today we are going to release that we're releasing part two. With uh, with my chat with Mark, and we talk about some more stuff uh, about his experience as a showrunner and some other untold stories that you maybe haven't heard of before. But um, I'm gonna remind you first that if you haven't done so already, please, I and it would mean so much to me, go and hit subscribe to the Show and Whisper wherever you get your podcasts at, whether it is a podcast, Spotify podcast, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible you name it like we are on all the platforms so wherever you get your pocket at the show and whisper is there and if you don't if you don't mind because this t- will only take maybe a minute or two of your time when you're on Apple podcast especially on a podcast hit that five star review a uh, rating and leave a little review of what you think about the show because that is the best way to get the show to expand and grow so that we can get more people to tune in. Because here's the thing, not everyone, not everyone is on social media, which I totally understand because social media is a shit show these days. And they sometimes they discover their shows and podcasts through literary listings on our podcast store. So the more ratings and reviews we get, the higher we get on that podcast store so that people will discover it. I've seen that we you know, made it into some of the top categories for TV and film and interviews, which has been amazing. So let's keep going at it. And, and also, this is a great way to offer your you know, your thoughts and what we can do to improve the show. Because I, of course, I always want to make the podcast the best it can be. So please, um, I, I want to hear from you. But, um, but yeah, so... On the on this episode, part two with Mark Guggenheim, and we talk about, like I said, some of his experiences again for being a showrunner, as well as also his upcoming novel. Uh, which, you, if you want to pre-order, there's a link in the show notes. You can go click on and, and pre-order right now. It comes out in August, and yeah, I'm really excited for you guys to hear. So I'm gonna shut up and just cue the music and let you enjoy. I'll see you at the end. <laughs> Well, speaking of social media, because you know, I, I feel Arrow and the Arrowverse really came because as someone who grew up with Smallville, like small, Twitter wasn't really that big when Smallville was still airing. So by the time you guys came around, that's when we started seeing this kind of more 
big interaction between the audience and you guys yes. because I, I remember i just remember the day when you greg etc came on twitter and had joined social media and so yeah. on how, so like as a show how did how much did you guys apply social media it, it, it not listen to but like take you know at least take it in because again i know you would you would, you would be very very yeah. communicating with fans you would post title pages which yeah. you know again that was that was a freaking blast in itself of like you know what is the next episode going to be called and then you know we all had to speculate so so how much how much did that factor in in the writers of, of like let's see what they're saying yeah. versus no this is the line we're drawing we have to focus on our vision for the show Oh yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, well, first of all, like we would take it in all, we would take it all in. I mean, we were all on Twitter. We would, we would, you know, some of us would live tweet during the episodes where we were always curious to see what Twitter was saying. But the, the thing that even to the, even if we were interested in, in having the Twitter affect the writer's room, and that's a separate conversation. Um, we we're working so far ahead of of twitter um we're working like there's just not uh, the way i sort of describe it is there's just there's no time to turn the the oil tank so a lot of times it, it was like oh twitter didn't like this wait till i see next week's episode all right because you know because we're we're working remember that the writing the production is obviously happening very far ahead of of actual air but the writing's happening even further ahead than the production there's honestly there's no way to sort of incorporate twitter's thoughts except to go you know shrug and go it's it's simply too late you know mm. um look i think i always subscribe to you know stan lee's he, he always said give the fans what they need not what they want i think if if that's you know that 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 seem to work out pretty well for Stan in the Marvel universe. And I always tried to, you know, follow that as well. Read every tweet. We, you know, it, it, I, I wouldn't say, like I said, it never arrived in time to actually impact the story. It was, it was always taken and, and appreciated for, you know, for just information about, you know, how the audience is responding. Was there any particular story you remember where you saw the reaction and you kind of felt that maybe, should we maybe have tackled this differently or should we not, you know, because I mean, one example I can think of, you know, which is, is obviously, you know, say the, the, the death of Laurel in season four, which I know that was, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I know I was very upset about it because, you know, Laurel, you know, Laurel was one of my favorites, but I always wonder, like, was there anything story, you know, whether it was that one or anything across your time on Arrow and Legend that you, that you felt like maybe, maybe we should have had a second go about this. Well, you know, it's very interesting actually because the I, I don't even want to call them the legends fandom and the arrow fandom because obviously there's sort of overlap between fandom mm. but the legends what i'll call the legends tweets and the arrow tweets were very 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 different in terms of tone like you would almost go like these almost have to be completely separate sets of fans because you, with the arrow we had a lot of angry fans with legends we never did so it's so it's interesting I think the death of Laurel, honestly, it wasn't my call. And I also think it's not so much uh, the, the thing that would have changed Laurel's fate, honestly, wasn't going to be Twitter. What would have changed it is if we had known that we were going to go for four more years. Uh, you know, ha ha had had we known that the show was only reaching its midpoint, uh, I don't think Laurel would have been killed off. But at the time, it was we were we always sort of saw the show as a five year show. It didn't really occur to us that it was going to go beyond that. So I think that it, if if we're talking about hindsight being twenty twenty, I think that's that that's a greater factor. I I don't believe in I, I don't believe in shows you know changing course for to satisfy a, a vocal set of fans. And and part of that is the way I watch television. I'm I approach all my writing as a fan first, but I'm the kind of fan, you know, yeah, do they do things on shows that I don't like as a fan? Sure, all the time. But it never occurred to me to have input in the process. You know, it never occurred to me to showrunner X or showrunner Y should should listen to what I have to say. I'm just a member of the audience and I don't believe, you know, the audience, it, I, I, television is not, it's not an interactive medium. And I know there's a lot of fans who hate here. I, I totally get that, but it's, it's not, it's just, I don't, I don't think that that 
produces good art, quite frankly. So yeah, that's my that's my probably probably controversial uh, sort of opinion. I will say, you know, in terms of things we wish we could have done differently, there, there's a lot of stuff in in season four. Like season four is probably my least favorite of of all the seasons, in large part because there were there were things that in in hindsight just you know just didn't work and things we shouldn't have necessarily tried like i think there's some incredibly strong uh episodes in season four don't get me wrong like there's some mm-hmm. episodes that i think are really 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 great episodes of arrow but overall as a season i think the idea to try a lighter tone it just wasn't you know it it, it wasn't true to the show uh, it wasn't true to what the show, you know, we we were we were going for a lighter tone because you know the first three seasons had been so dark. And bear in mind, like you know, a, a lighter tone for Arrow is very different from a lighter tone for most shows. Yeah. You know, we still we still like you know ended the mid season finale with you know Oliver and uh, and and uh, Felicity being attacked and Felicity being paralyzed. Um, I do wish we had approached that whole storyline very differently. You know, I've said this before in other interviews, but like we always plan every season out uh, of Arrow, but I think the best seasons are the ones where we where we give ourselves the freedom to alter course, not based on Twitter, but really just based on, you know, how the story is just playing out. And there were things in in season four that we had specifically planned for at specific moments in time. I think we stuck to, I just think we stuck to the game plan too rigidly um, in a lot of places, you know, so if I, you know, if I could sort of, go back and and redo things uh i certainly would i will say like i i love the season finale of season four you know we wanted to do an epic you know street battle with a lot of extras that felt like you know the end of dark knight rises and i I feel like we succeeded in that there's a lot of groundwork that's done to introduce you know the adam and and ray palmer um you know that that i i think worked extremely well um there you know like i said there's individual episodes that that i i like a great deal. Uh, the the finale again being a good example um but uh you know not you know when you do eight seasons of television not not every season is going to be perfect no of course of course i um no you're, you're talking about the atom and i'm thinking you know i'm thinking in an alternate universe where where brandon still would have been because I, I mean, I'm, I think you said that this part was true, but you know where he was supposed to be, Ted, the Ted Corridor. Yeah, yeah, that was no. that was the original that was the original game plan. And uh, and you know, look, and and it, I think it's it's interesting. Like uh, DC was was really really great to work with. They they you know more off they said yes far more times than they said no. Um, you know, and when they said no, they always had good reasons. Um, and they, when they said no, it, it always was followed very quickly with, but how about this? Which is wonderful. I think, you know, I think it's also important to remember, like when DC signed on to this show, they didn't know that we were going to be going into so many corners of the DC universe and coming to them, asking them, you know, for this character and that character, you know, they, they rolled with the punches, I think extraordinarily well. Yeah, no, I, I'm just thinking because I, because part of me, like, you know, I, th- I think you're being very, I think you're being fairly diplomatic about it, but I'm thinking, you know, like they, they, them getting told no for Ted, supposedly because, you know, we're going to use him somewhere else. And here we are 13 years later. Where was he? Well, you know, I'll tell you, I, the only time that bothered me, and I was, I was off the show as a showrunner by this point, but, and, the only time that really bothered me was the legends being told that uh, we could no longer use Constantine. Um, oh, so that and, was, so so that was true. The rumor that the uh, the reason we didn't have him, why Matt Ryan didn't come back as Constantine, was because you got he got pulled. Oh, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Uh, what a bad <laughs> connection. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, no, but that was the that was the hot rumor that was going yeah. around. So uh, there's I, probably yeah. a lot of truth to that rumor is probably all I'll say. But yeah, <laughs> I've got myself. I think I've got myself into enough. Trouble. No, but, okay, okay, no, no, no. If I put it this way, we knew there was a constant show coming to HBO Max by AJ Abrams, yeah. and so you know, I think everyone could kind of put the pieces together. That well, I, this, I, I would say that that was pretty. That was a pretty. In that case, that was a realistic, uh, uh, you know, uh, deduction, and it's. You know, obviously, given the fact that um, that show never came to pass, it's it's particularly uh, disappointing that 
you know, we had to, you know, shift gears with Matt, uh, who is, you know, not not just terrific as Constantine, but just a terrific actor in general. Oh, um, 100%. You know, but I think, you know, look, it's, it's a, I, I, I'm, I, it's funny, you said I was being diplomatic. And, and the truth is, I, I think I'm just being fair. Like, I always tried to be very empathetic um, to DC's plight um when i you know was working with them to the point where like they don't know that they're not going to do ted cord you know they they have plans to do ted cord and that's you know all they can really go off of they, just like they had plans to do a jj abrams produced constantine show i i think you know sort of managing these characters is is a little bit like you're playing chess um but you're you're playing chess off of you know five different chess boards um, at the same yeah. time, all without an idea as to, you know, how those games are going to play out. Um, so I, you know, that, that, that sort of, you know, it's, it sort of goes to my philosophy, you know, of, I always try very, very hard to not get angry if someone does something I don't like or makes a decision that I don't agree with. Um, because they're they're coming to it with their own point of view you know um and you know there's, there's a saying don't don't ascribe to malice what what can easily be ascribed to mistake and you know sometimes you know people just make mistakes um it happens it's not you know not, nothing is you know and and dc never you know they never like uh did anything with with malicious intent it was always like i said they're they're you know, playing, you know, five different games of chess, you know, probably even more than that no, all at the same time. Fair enough. I think yeah. the reason, I think I, I, you know, the way I look at it is that, well, because, you know, they were so quick to embrace the multiverse aspect where, like, you know, I'm thinking DC would it really have hurt that, you know, if we had a Ted Corn arrow for a couple yeah. of years and then eventually when you did your, you know, even though it never comes to fruition, you know, whatever they were going to do with Ted would have happened so on because I, you know, because I, I can't imagine how frustrating it must be as a show having to, alter plans but not last minute but yeah again you know they say no to him but how about this and then you still have, you know but you guys that still comes with extra work of having to figure out how do we fit in ray palmer into this world where you know like how do we do the suit how do we do the powers and stuff like that that suit i gotta say like i mean maya manny um and ken harlu uh our costume designer and prop master um they I don't think again they get enough credit for that Adam suit. That Adam suit is that that thing is a marvel. Um, it is it it's got electronics in it. It's got like it it's a movie quality costume. It cost like the first you know it, it's a little bit like a prescription drug. You know the 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 second pill you know costs ninety nine cents, but the the first pill costs three billion dollars. Um, the the first iteration of you know the first version of the costume that cost over a quarter million dollars um which was insane like the you know to spend uh you know um certainly the studio thought we were completely mad um but it's all you know th these are all custom fitted pieces you know that all go together it li it's literally like it's a costume that required a handler <laughs> Like you know, there was literally a technician that that would travel with the costume, um, and uh, it, it's it, it's simply amazing. It's probably my you know I'm often asked like what's my favorite Arrowverse costume, and I, I you know that's that's the Adam costume is probably it. You know it's um, simply because it it's such an ambitious uh, piece of work. Yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, I'm, even though like. I'm, you know, I'm sure it was really heavy for for Brandon. You know, I mean, you know, because people thinking, oh, he's a big dude, he can take it. Like, no, it looked. Oh no, heavy. it's heavy. It's, I mean, it it literally like it came in its own like like series of cases, like these special protective cases that oh, roll. Wow. Yeah, like I mean, the thing was, you know, a, a huge, huge, huge undertaking. Um, and and you know, it's got like I said, cables and electronics and like there's gears that are actually moving. Like, you know, I think some people thought in a lot of movies, you know, if you've got something like 
a gear that's that's spinning, they'll usually add that in post. And it's like, no, no, that was all practical. No, like, no, that, that, that was that was, that looked real. <laughs> yeah, it's all real. It's all real. Um, it's amazing. Um, you know, it's like I, you know, I, 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 I remember us going through the process of building it um, and going up to Vancouver and, and being in the workshops and going like, how is this ever going to work? How is this ever going to come together? And, and Ken and Maya, man, they, they, you know, they, they always had faith in it. They always knew how it was going to turn out. Um, you know, if you look at Maya's original design, um, it looks like the original design. There's, there's no compromise to it. There's no, there were no corners cut. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it was the best quarter of a million dollars that uh, the shows had ever spent. Hey, how you doing, party people? Let me whisper in your ear. Tell you a little something you might like to hear. <laughs> What's going on, brothers and sisters? It's your man, Brother Nate, from the Lituation Room, as well as the Kings of Sport podcast. And I'm here to tell you about the Multiverse of Color. See, the showrunner whisperer is brought to you exclusively by Multiverse of Color. Now, Multiverse of Color is your home for fresh takes on the world of pop culture by established journalists and emerging content creators. It's your one-stop destination for a vast array of articles as well as audio and video productions. Multiverse of Color features exclusive interviews, media event coverage, and film analysis. We're talking about all films, all movies out here on these streets, from Hollywood's biggest blockbusters to the most intimate of independent projects. So visit multiverseofcolor.com today, yes, today, right now, for all of the latest stories and follow Multiverse of Color through the social media links provided in the description below. And now, to the showrunner whisperer now i by the time you you know having been you know up, you know away from that fashion up for a little bit um do you hope to revisit it at some point you know i i know last year was you know it's uh one of the things that came out in your newsletter was you know how you were feeling about these students stuff like that and you know i, I know i definitely had thoughts on it so but like now that you've you know it's been a couple of years since you finished the shows since you got to, you know since uh you you got to this point. Would you want to revisit this genre in any way possible? Like like where are you? You know again if you you know if you can tease and I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about your upcoming book as well. You know do you want to revisit this genre or do you feel like you're now on a path of focusing on different chapters for your career? Oh, um, that's interesting. It, it it's funny. I it never occurred to me to do something different. Um, I uh, I would love to revisit it. Um, I, I, well, certainly I would love to do an, you know, their superhero property, um, you know, and I'd love to revisit Arrow specifically. Stephen and I, you know, uh, talk about, it, you know, every, you know, every now and again, I, you know, I think prefer to wait a little bit longer before revisiting Oliver. I'd love to do something, uh, in the comic book space, um, to sort of, I, I'd love to do something where we kind of give a proper ending to the Arrowverse. Um, and I think the only way to do that probably would be through a comic book, but I don't know, maybe, you know, animated movie. I, I was funny. It, it was, I, I was just about to say like, maybe an animated movie, you know, um, I think, and uh, you know, I think that would be really, really great. You know, I, I, I would love to give it its proper, its proper, uh, you know, it, its proper end. So that, that would be fun. Um, and then, you you know it's funny like i like i said i'd i'd love to you know do another superhero property um but it's not the only thing that i'm i'm interested in doing um oh, but, uh, you know you know the way i i always say like i i work for 10 year old me um if 10 year old me would get excited um then i usually say yes yeah no because i know you came very close to you know with um with Green Lantern on uh, Brave Real Max, you know, because again, I, you know, I know the first, you know, first time with Green Lantern was, it had end results that you guys were probably not hoping for. Again, as someone who has seen, you know, those original scripts that came out that you guys had written, I'm like, oh, oh, if only we could have gotten that because I, I love the, 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 the extra nest that we got of Hal and Carol, um, and uh, instead we just got them in real life with Blake and Ryan for the rest of their lives. Well, I, I, you know, I, I mean. You know, Ryan, Blake, you're welcome. 
you know, <laughs> I'm, glad something, I'm glad something long lasting came from that movie. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's, it, you, you just never know. I also think I will say, you know, I look, Green Lantern turned out very differently from what we had planned and, and you alluded to our earlier drafts. Um, and, but I will say like, even the finished product, I think if you were to grade it on the curve of a lot of superhero movies that have come before and since, um, I think Green Lantern holds up better um, if, if graded. It definitely up. does. And I'm not saying this is just blow smoke up. I, I, I was like, you know, I know it has this issue, but it's not... It's not as problematic as people say it out to be, you know. I mean, I've you know, we've seen I've seen far worse even, you know, within the last three, four years. I'm not gonna name any names, but you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I I have certainly found myself watching certain superhero movies going, and you gave me shit for Green Lantern. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, <laughs> so I, I yeah, you know, um again, I, I always say grade me on a curve. Um, but uh, you know, I also, you know. I I also if had had it not been for the Green Lantern experience, there wouldn't be Arrow, you know, and there wouldn't be an Arrowverse. Um, you know, Arrow Arrow very much came directly from the experience that we had on Green Lantern, and um, you know, I think you know that's that's how you learn in life is you know you gotta you gotta you know try some things that don't necessarily work out the way you intended. If if you can, I mean, I know you there's probably not much you can say about it, but. Um... Can, is there anything you can share about your time on the Green Lantern show? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, it was going to be awesome. <laughs> um, it was going to be great. Like, uh, we had we had uh, James Mangold's go to production designer. Uh, we had the uh, the the woman who designs the costumes for the boys and a million other superhero shows. Um, we. You got Laura Jean for the green. Oh yes. my god! Yeah. Oh, and you should see those costumes. By the way, not a single bit of CG in any of them. Um, <laughs> I have, I have the designs like on my phone. Um, like, yeah. Oh god, they looked amazing. We had, I mean, the production art, like you, it would blow you away. Honestly, like stuff that that looked. Now it looked incredible, but looked like a movie. We had a, an amazing writing staff. Um, we had, you know, we, we'd written all eight scripts um, of the first season. So uh, I know, I know what the show would have been, um, you know, and it, and it was going to be, you know, emotional and exciting with, with two different time periods and um, some, you know, I think incredibly strong character work that was, you know, very true to the, it was, it was very, very true to the franchise of Green Lantern. Um, and uh, it, it, yeah, bums me out. But uh, I, you know, th- you know, unfortunately that's, that's the, the reality of doing TV in, you know, the 2020s is you can write an entire season of television and not shoot a frame. Um, and it didn't always used to be that way, but it is that way now. And, uh, it's, it's a bummer. I, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of self-control some days to avoid going on Instagram or Twitter and being like, this is what you could have had. Um, I was, cause I was so ready for, for Simon Boz, you know, as a Middle Eastern myself, you know, because sure. I know how important that story is, especially in today's yeah. political climate. So I, you know. That we day, had a, I, a wonderful, like our, our plans for Simon were really cool. The costume that Laura had designed for him was amazing. Um, yeah, we, we had some really, really, really cool plans. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's a bummer. Um, that's, that's all I'll say. No, I understand. And well, let's talk about in any lifetime. Um, first of all, I saw, you know, again, uh, what a, the cover was beautiful. Oh, thank I, you. you know, yeah, they were... did an amazing job. Actually, I, I will tell you, say like um, you know the Amazon, uh, you know the Amazon publisher, uh, like they had originally designed a, a completely different design for the cover of the book, and on their own, um, to use the legal term sua sponte, um, decided it wasn't good enough, and literally went back to the drawing board and, and came up with a completely different design, um, and uh, it it was you know it's pretty cool. 
Well, I what I'm interested in because again, when when you and I had initially start talking about setting up this interview and you know talking about this book, I was really like, I wonder what he's writing about because you know you've written so much in your career and you know you're dealing now with uh, you know you're going back to uh, a territory that has been now very you know has exploded now in Hollywood in this Hollywood genre with the multiverse. What how was it? How challenging was it to kind of find a new angle to it? Because you know, like you know, some some might say. You know how much multiverse do we need? I mean, even with Marvel, they're even struggling with it right now. So, like, how did what 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 is what are you bringing to this this concept that we haven't really seen before? Well, well, first of all, um, I I've been working on this book in in some way, shape, or form for the last ten years. So, um, I, I started you know working on it before the multiverse really was a thing, and before I had gotten involved with Crisis on Infinite Earths and and you know, playing around with the multiverse that way. Um, uh, but the the way it's different is is the way the multiverse operates. Um, in the in the book, basically, there there's this the way the way we put it is the universe favors certain outcomes. Um, it's why on every planet there's oxygen, on every planet there's people, on every planet there's you know X, Y, and Z. And, and because the multiverse favors certain outcomes, um, we, the protagonist who's, who's trying to find his, his deceased wife, there's only one universe where his wife is still alive. Um, and so it's not like a version of the multiverse where um, you, you have, you know, if you have 50 million universes, you get 50 million different versions of a person um th this is a much more uh i would say unforgiving multiverse uh, particularly since uh the the universe itself is actually trying to stop the protagonist and is throwing obstacles up in the protagonist way so the the idea of sort of the many worlds theory uh of of multiverses where you get you know an infinite number of very very different universes um we, we go the opposite direction in the novel um and it you know we, we still have we you know we have some some craziness um some multiversal craziness but um for the for the most part it's a very um unusual uh way of, of approaching parallel universes it's sort of like the opposite of the way you've seen parallel universes typically portrayed in comic books and film and books and whatnot because when i was reading the the, the synopsis i was thinking in the back of my mind I wonder if he's planning to do a show or a movie out of this, like you know, because I could kind of almost like see some of the like the story beats of like in in live action. Is that something that you're co contemplating, maybe? You know, it's funny when whenever I do something in either comics or um, or prose, there's always the possibility that um, it could find a second life uh, in TV or film. Um, in my perfect world, I wouldn't be the one to adapt my own work. Um, you know, oh, really? Uh, yeah. I, in many ways, like it's funny, I'm doing it now with Two Dead to Die, which is the graphic novel I did with Howard Jakin. And um, we, you know, I, I adapted that uh, as a film for Universal. But for the most part, um, when I tell a story, I've told the story and I've sort of scratched the itch. Um, okay. So I don't have an overwhelming desire to, um, I don't have an overwhelming desire to, to, reapproach it in another medium um but you know i would never say never um and i i do think you know i i structured uh the novel the same way i would structure a movie with with uh three acts and um and uh it, it had you know i i think it's sort of like you can take the boy out of uh you know out of screenplays you can't take the screenplays out of the boy um you know i i my brain still tends to work in terms of cinematic structure so um i imagine the novel would be fairly easy to adapt um into a film but uh i would i would love it if it was another writer doing the adapting that's fair well, that's fair um i know we're starting to run out of time but i am um before i ask my last question and uh, hopefully you know maybe we can have another set down you know when the when once the book has come out because i would love to talk sure. to you about it and uh, other things we were able to talk about in this on this interview regarding your your showrunner journey but uh, for my final question about showrunning if um 
if you if you if you could talk to fans or critics directly in terms of like th- their perception of show running, if there's a misconception you could clear up, what would that misconception? What would you want to clear up personally about Ooh, the idea question. of show running? That's a great question. Um, I think I'd want to. I think I'd want to disabuse anyone of the notion that it's easy. Um, it, it's a really hard. It's a really hard job. Um, you know, and it's not that it's not occasionally fun and it's not that it's not occasionally rewarding um otherwise i don't know why anyone would do it um but it's hard um it's hard and i i think it's it's a it's a little i imagine having never given birth to anyone uh that it's a little bit like the pain of childbirth um where you know when you're going through it it's it's excruciating and and very conveniently you start to forget (laughs) um how how brutal it was but uh I, you know, I, I also will say it, it's, it is very, very rewarding. I really enjoy working with other people. Um, I, I enjoy the collaborative nature of show running and I enjoy, you know, I, I enjoy the, the challenges that come with the difficulties as much as I enjoy, you know, everything else, but there's nothing, there's nothing quite like feeling like you've, you've helped put together something special, both in terms of a work environment and in terms of a, fi- a finished product. Um, that, that's a that's a great adrenaline rush that is, uh, it never gets old. Well, Mark, thank you so much for sharing your 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 long journey, you know, your, your, you know the 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 odyssey, if you will, <laughs> you know, the, the ups, the, the downs, the, 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 the uh, the crazy and the fun. So uh, I, I cannot wait for people to hear it is in your experience that, you know, again, you're you know, running some of the biggest shows on, on, uh, of our, of our, of this generation, especially something as huge as Arrowverse. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mark, again, so much for your time. And uh, also just thank you for all the interactions so over the years. And the fact that you even remembered me, I was kind of like, Oh, of course. You know, yeah. Oh no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, it's always good to talk to you, man. It's been far too long. Yeah, it's been far too long. Hopefully, we can talk very soon again. So, uh, yeah, take care of yourself, and uh, I will see you. I will see you when I see you. Sounds good. All right, thanks, man. And welcome back. That was my the my second part and the final part of my Mark Guggenheim interview. So, major thank you to to Mark for his uh, generosity and generous time. We had a great time chatting about his career about you know the ups and downs and you know the in between and uh, hopefully we'll have him back in, in the very near future because you know I'm excited to see what he does next but um but yeah I want to remind you that uh, we're going to be back in August with uh, another episode because again like because we had to push off part 2 um till you know to this wednesday that means that there there won't there won't be an episode on the 31st as planned but and but yeah it's gonna be fun we have more episodes being recorded and lots of more conversations going on but um if you want to find me because i'm i'm gonna just insert here right now that where you know i'm gonna you're gonna start hearing like a pre-recorded um intro and outro now for the show when I whisper when we get the uh, because it's basically I'm saying the same thing every week and I feel like every week I say I I forget something or I leave something out but uh, if you want to find me you can find me at Adam Backed on all social media Facebook Twitter Instagram YouTube Vero uh, Twitch Cake TikTok you name it Freds uh, I'm on there I'm a senior writer uh, uh, and interviewer for screenrant.com so I cover all the superhero stuff that that exists out there for the news and interviews team so I have lots of stuff that had just come out uh, so check it out I'm also the editor chief of Multiverse of Color as you heard before and we yeah that's where you can find me at and um now, all, all the links to my stuff is in the show notes. So if you want to, you know, just a simple link where you can find me, just click on the show notes below and it will take you to all them good places. And um, But yeah, I, I'm going to leave it over to my past, future me. That's a good question. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head over to the my other me to for the plugs for for the podcast uh, but once again thank you everyone so much for tuning for the mark guggenheim chat and look forward to more interviews coming up and um yeah with that said let's find out where you can find the show nor whisper at
To find the Shonen Whisper online, visit ShonenWhisper.com where you can get all the latest episodes as well as exclusives from some of our interviews with said showrunners. If you want to email or contact Shonen Whisper, you can contact us at ShonenWhisper at gmail.com. On social media, we're at Showrunner Talk and at Multiverse Color on Twitter. On Instagram slash Freds, we're at Shonen Whisper and at The Multiverse of Color. On Facebook, we're at Shonen Whisper and at Multiverse of Color. And on TikTok, we're at Shonen Whisper and at Multiverse of Color. Remember, the Shonen Whisper is a Multiverse of Color Originals, which is your destination for, for pop culture from the lens of people of color and members of the LGBTQ plus community. So please visit multiverseofcolor.com for all the latest news and reviews and interviews. And if you want to subscribe to the Shonen Whisper, we're available on multiple platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Podchaser, Amazon Music, Deezer, Ghana, Podcast Index, CastBox, Podcast Addict, Radio Public, YouTube Podcasts, Audible, Podbean, and everywhere else you can find your podcast at. Also, while you're on Apple Podcasts, do us a favor, as we would massively appreciate it if you want to help support the show. Leave us a five-star rating and review on our podcast and let us know what you enjoy most about the show and what we can do to improve the podcast. Leaving us a five-star rating and review on our podcast will help us get elevated in the Apple podcast store so that more people can discover the show on our whisper as not everyone is on social media these days. And this is how they discover their shows directly for Apple podcast. We would massively appreciate your support and your time. On behalf of my entire media team, Julian Bell, Mike Schmidt, Nate Milton, I'm Andrew Vite, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Show on Whisper.